There's a lot happening here. They, they've crossed the line. They've drifted too far in a culture. But Jesus does what he always does. There's always hope, isn't there? There's always time to change. But it's got to be on your end to repent. And so Jesus says to both these churches, if you would repent, there's hidden manna. What does this mean? It means spiritual nourishment and divine provision. If you repent, there will be a white stone with a new name. It means purity, victory, and acceptance with Christ. If you repent, there would be the ability to have authority over nations. You will be able to rule and reign and judge with Christ. And then finally, if you repent, you'd have the morning star. He will be your hope. He will be your guidance. This is the presence of Jesus that's available to you if you would just lose sight of culture and get your sight back on Christ. We don't know what came next for both of these churches, but all I know is that they had a lot of thinking to do. Were they going to continue with culture, which in the, the moment, the temporary, might have been fun, but long term, that would have been uh, pretty damning, wouldn't it? They could do that. They could go with culture, or they could do the hard part, which is I'm going to turn away from my sin and although I'm going to experience suffering, persecution, I'm going to have to change a lot of things. We're probably going to even have to excommunicate some people within this church. It will actually be better for them long term. We don't know what came of them, as I said. But we have an opportunity today to make sure that we're not like these churches. This is why it's important, can I just say, to bring your Bible with you. It, what would happen if I started to deviate and you didn't have scripture in front of you to understand context or maybe to have an application study Bible or study Bible, study Bible of some kind? What would happen if we were teaching things that would please your ears but not please your soul? It's important today to understand what is it that we believe in? What do we stand on? Because there's a lot of people out there trying to twist the truth. And I think I'm jumping way too far ahead, but I want to answer this question. How do we make sure that we don't become like these churches? I want to give you five, five points. Number one, we battle against compromise every day. We battle against compromise every day. What is compromise? I like this definition. It says it's the blending of two qualities, different points of view, and it leads to a concession of closely held principles. Every day we are tempted by faith and culture, aren't we? We're, we're tempted to join together our beliefs with what society believes. We've allowed people to influence us. They call themselves influencers who claim that they are Christians, but as you look at their life, they don't live by any of the principles that the word of God says that we are to live by. We've allowed people into our circles who are shaping us. And it's not just in extreme ways. It's very subtle, small things. They try to twist and justify and pervert the word of God in order to make themselves feel better. So what do we do? I'll tell you what we can't do. We can't hide. We can't hide. God wants us to promote Christian values and culture. He wants us to be able to tell culture that there is actually a better way to living than what you're experiencing right now. And, and I'm sorry, but if living out your Christian values, if, if calling things what they are and standing on the truth of the word of God calls you a Christian nationalist, then, then I want to be on that side. We are called to promote our values, not hide in secrets. But doing that requires us to be very care careful that we don't embrace the worldly values that go against our kingdom values. And I love the stories of Joseph and Daniel, two men. And there's, there's other examples out there, right? We, we see somebody like Esther who lived out her, her, her godly values, even though she could have been killed for what she was about to do to save her people. But I look at Joseph and Daniel who worked alongside authorities, who worked alongside kings, and though they worked alongside of them, they still remained faithful to the Lord despite knowing what could potentially come if they stood their ground. You can't pray anymore. All right, Daniel, I'm going to pray three times a day. 
what's going to happen? You're going to be thrown in a lion's den. So what? God, God's going to deliver me somehow. Look, look at the Old Testament prophets. Go to Hebrews 11. Look at those that stood up for their values in the midst of chaos. The Lord always delivers. So again, what do we do to combat compromise? I say it like this. You got to fight against it in every arena in life. What does this mean? First of all, it starts in the heart. It starts in the heart. Proverbs 4.23 says, guard your heart above all else for it determines the course of your life. Not the course of your day, the course of your life. You got to guard your heart. Matthew 15, 18 through 19 says, but the words you speak, where do they come? They come from the heart. That's what defiles you from the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, all sexual immorality, theft, lying, and slander. And so what we allow into our hearts, what we allow for our eyes to consume, our ears to hear, they will ultimately come through our words and even our actions. We can't give this world an all-access pass to our heart because this is where compromise starts and we'll find every reason every way. We'll find other people to help us compromise and to justify wrong what the Bible says, uh, to justify right what the Bible says is wrong. When David sinned against Bathsheba, he paid the price, didn't he? And in his repentance, Psalm 51, where does he go? He goes to the core of the problem. David says, God, create in me a clean heart, right? Create in me a clean heart. This is where we start fighting the battle. The second place is our home. Some of us here in the room, we need to have a serious talk with our spouse, our accountability partner. I don't know who it is, but we need to have some deeper conversations about what it is that we are permitting into this place we call home. And if you're going to compromise on small things, don't be surprised if one day you will start compromising in bigger areas. And don't be surprised if your kids take it further than what you did. You've heard that phrase before, what you do in moderation, your kids will do in excess. It's truth. It's truth. The enemy is always looking for the smallest entrance. It's okay to have standards. It's okay to teach your kids why we don't watch that, why do we don't listen to this, why we don't go over there. It's okay to have standards. If you want to be their best friend now, then long term, you're going to lose out on a strong relationship. But if you have strong values now and you parent like you're supposed to parent, you're going to have a friend uh, for a lifetime. What you may excuse as innocent has the potential to hurt your family. Number three of this, relationships. If you have people in your life who are causing you to sin, can I tell you that it's probably best to step aside from that conversation, that relationship. Years ago, if you've been here for some time, you, you heard about how for three, four years uh, before, before I went to other coffee shops, uh, I would go to Starbucks every morning. It first started years ago, 2017, because I read a book called Saturate, how Jesus needs to enter us so that we can make a difference in this world. And I just felt compelled that every day, 6 a.m., I'm going to make my way to Starbucks and just start having influence on people there. Because I, wor I work in a church office all day, Right? And so I made that commitment. Over time, there was this group that was uh, meeting, and they were just a random group that figured out, hey, we all like coffee, we all like sports, all these other things, let's meet together. And so they, they invited me, hey, would you want, we see you sitting by yourself all the time, would you want to join in and be a part of our group? We ranged from me being the youngest all the way up to like 70 years old. It was a great group, fantastic group. But not everybody in that group was Christians. They would talk about things that were just not okay. They would look at women in ways that you just shouldn't look at women. They would go to places that go against my values. I would be invited. I would be encouraged to partake in those conversations. There were moments even around sporting events like the Super Bowl or March Madness where they would bet on things and they would invite me to be participate in those opportunities. Eventually, I had to come to the place, especially around COVID when things got crazy, where I said, I, I can't do this anymore. I've got to step aside. Those were some good friends, solid friends outside of this church. But can I tell you that it was tempting me to compromise. And I would say to anybody in this room, if somebody's calling, if they're challenging you to compromise, you need to really question, is this a relationship 
that I'm strong enough to handle right now. Doesn't mean you're saying no forever, but right now, am I strong enough to handle this relationship? Remember, bad company, it corrupts good character. The churches in Pergamum and Thyatira, they tolerated too many people who ultimately influenced their walk. And so I want to say this, cooperate. Uh, Be involved with people's lives, but avoid alignment. Uh, Avoid partnership and participating in things that would violate the standards that not just you set for yourself, but what the Word of God has set for you. And then finally, society. We talked last week about how we will experience suffering if we live out our beliefs. It's just a guarantee. And when we fear ridicule, when we feel, uh, fear shame or being made fun of experiencing backlash, I- I'll tell you what's going to happen. You're going to stay silent and then you're going to compromise. If nobody knows that you're a Christian, uh, they're going to they're gonna promote things. They're going to push you to do things that if you're unwilling to stand up for truth, then you're probably going to give in to at some point. But if you remain faithful to God in a culture that's completely against you, God will fight for you. He will rescue you. You don't have to give in to things that go against your kingdom values. So don't conform to society. They don't like what we stand for. So quit caving in. If if your desire is to be loved, look at Jesus, right? They crucified him for promoting love. So understand that that's the reality for all those that live out their faith in society. Temporary struggle, struggle is better than eternal pain. And there's one final place that we, we've got to fight compromise, and it really connects to the second point, which is the church. We all, we, we all collectively share the responsibility to protect this place. Everybody. When you look at these passages, was it the pastor that was rebuked? Was it the deacons that were rebuked? Was it the nursery care workers that were rebuked? Were they responsible? Absolutely, but so was everyone else. There's a story about a pastor who hosted a prayer meeting in his church for a group of guys, and when they all gathered together, he saw something that he didn't notice before. It says, rather than praying about spiritual needs of the church as he expected, all of the men, without exception, they prayed about the sins of the culture, sins they didn't even have proximity to or personal experience with. And so what the pastor did in that moment is he decided to actually bring that prayer meeting to an end with the prayer of the tax collector. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Be merciful to me, a sinner. See, we may not have the same issues or challenges that the churches did that we've been discussing, but but we can cave into things here in this church or we can continue to allow things by permitting them to happen, by accepting them as just a part of our culture and we ignore them. But everyone here is responsible for protecting the witness of this church. If you see or hear something that's being taught that goes against scripture, confront that person. If you see people cheating, lying, stealing, if you see sexual immorality of some kind, if you, if you hear gossip, address it. If the only time you want to get with other people is to bring them into your issues by gossiping with one another about church life, um, first of all, repent. But second of all, if you're on the other end and you're being invited, uh, address them. Call them out. And we'll talk about that here in a moment. But if people are coming in trying to deceive people, we need to confront them. I've had so many requests in this church for guest speakers, people I've never heard of, seen. And I'm very careful who we allow behind this pulpit. We've got to keep this desk sacred. And I would say that to everyone in this room, be careful of who you allow to speak into your heart. We're all responsible. So let's eliminate any form of compromise. But let's make sure also that it's true compromise, not based on our own personal preferences, but on godly principles. And so with that, if if correction comes your way, just like it came to these churches in Revelation, I want you to know that when it's done in love, it's actually a good thing. So number three, how do we protect ourselves from becoming a church like this? Well, we welcome correction when it's rooted in love. 
I think one of the greatest struggles right now in the American church is that we don't like confrontation. I'm reading a great book right now called The Bait of Satan, John Bevere. Anybody ever heard of that? Maybe at some point we'll do a sermon series on it. But we're, we're so afraid of offense. We fear that someone won't like us anymore. We fear that it's going to be a challenge to discuss hard things with one another. But confrontation, if it's done in love, it should not be feared. You're calling them to a higher standard that you know that they're capable of. You're, you're calling them to a higher standard, not to tear them down, but to lift them up. Ephesians 4.15 says, Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way, more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. So everyone in this room, can I just challenge you, if you're watching us online, can I challenge you that we should have this mentality of growth. And with growth comes this understanding that I can't do it alone. I need other people in my life that will help me to become who God's called me to be. I remember in 2013, I was at that point getting close to like 300 pounds and I went to the president of our school and I said, hey, I would love to get into running someday. What, where, where do I start? He ran some marathons and other things. And kid you not, he looked me up and down. He said, well, you're going to have to start by losing some weight. And as much as I hated hearing that, it was kind of like, ouch, that was what I needed to hear. We need other people in our life, even if it caused some pain to call us to a higher standard. When we speak truth in love, we help people become who God's called them to be. Where were the Christians in Pergamon? Where were the Christians in Thyatira who opened their mouth. Well, maybe one of them was Antipas, who we talked about, who was actually martyred for his faith, perhaps because of fear of what they saw with their friend, they kept quiet. And can I say to you in this room that we shouldn't fear being quiet. We need correction. We need to know, hey, are we deviating from the mission that God's called us to? Are we promoting things from society that are just wrong? Because if we stay silent, we'll continue going down the wrong course. And someday, we're going to look back and wonder, where did things go wrong? It's because we lost our voice. We need each other. And so if anyone comes to you with the heart of Christ, you should welcome it because it's what's best for you. Number four, and we're almost done here. Worship team, you guys can come to the front as well at this time. Number four, we care more about spiritual growth than material. The church of Thyatira, I, again, I love what it was said here. Jesus praised them for their deeds, love, faith, service, endurance. In verse 19, I've already acknowledged it, but it says that you are doing more than you did at first. And so despite the issues that were plaguing this church, they weren't complacent in their faith. But in this hardworking city, they also face the pressure of pursuing the material by not losing their jobs and their status. And what I want to say to us here today is to check your motivations. Are you doing more now in your walk with Jesus than what you did when you first believed? Are you excelling in love? Are you, are you excelling in endurance? Are you excelling in faith? Are you a better person today than when you were 10 years ago, five years ago, 30 years ago? And if not, you might have to ask yourself, am I pursuing things of this world more than I'm pursuing the things that will be eternal, the kingdom principles that I am called to align with? What do you care more about, the temporary or the eternal? Don't become complacent in your spiritual growth. A few weeks ago, our staff was watching a leadership podcast and it talked about 16 things that you should do every day. It came actually from Jim Harbaugh, the coach of the Los Angeles Chargers. And one of his points that I loved is this, choose to be better today than what you were yesterday. Choose to be better tomorrow than what you are today. So I ask in your spiritual walk, are you choosing to be better today than what you were yesterday? Are you predetermining to be better tomorrow than where you're at here today? There's always room for growth. There's always room. And finally, number five, we've got to determine that it's okay to be different. 
We've got to determine that it's okay to be different. Part of the reason why compromise happens is because too much of the church loves the world. We're so influenced by them that we want their approval. We want what it is that they have. But as Christians, we have to have this mentality that says that we're not like everybody else. We're not going to go to those places. We're not going to watch those things. We're not going to consume that content. We're not going to spend like the rest of the world. We're not going to talk like the rest of the world. We're going to live our lives in light of eternity. This is not our home. Each of us were bought with a price, so live it out. Standing strong against the pressures and temptations of society, it requires what we talked about last week, which is courage. But the alternative is an eternity that's separated from God, and that's a, that's a scary reality that this church that we read about, both of these churches who thought that they were doing good, who thought that they were living for Christ, they were, they were challenged and they were told, listen, if you continue this way, you will be cut off for all of eternity. And I wonder in this place, how many people think that you're, you're just doing good, you're, you're on the right path, but you're really not. It's a scary thing to be blind to our own spiritual condition, but that's what the enemy does. He wants you to think that, hey, if you just attend community groups, if you just give a little bit, if you just pay for a student to go to a retreat, you're doing things that on the outside look and appear good, but on the inside things are just not good. I'm challenging you today to repent. And don't mess around with those same things over and over again that you're repenting for. Repentance isn't a continual run around with the same issues. It's an it's a understanding that I'm putting my foot in the ground, turning away, never to go back to that lifestyle, never to go back to those practices again. And I know this might sound hard to, to some of you, but there's always hope attached to this message that if you would repent, if you would turn away from these things, you have a promise of eternity. See, the hard part has already been taken care of. The sacrifice has been made through Jesus, something that you couldn't do on your own. The hard part's been done. Now, because we have the Holy Spirit, he helps us to live the life that we're called to live. So what is temporary suffering in light of eternal reward? It's really not that much. We're here, the book of James talks about life is but a vapor. Here today, here today, gone tomorrow, right? So let me challenge you with this one big idea. And I think it needs to be understood, especially us here in the, the American church. It's that God, he will not tolerate a church that embraces unbiblical and popular beliefs of the day. God cannot. And I believe God's blessing this church in this season right now and he's continued to do so since 1903 because we stood on biblical principles. There's a lot of churches right now, there's entire denominations that are caving in to the pressures of culture. I don't see them flourishing, I actually see them dying. And I'm believing that revival would take place not just in this church, but in those churches. That the Holy Spirit would convict there's a better way if you keep going your own way, there's only destruction. So let's look at these letters as hope, because that's what they should be. 